Today, we cover the cal participle, and it is the last conjugation of the cal stem. What are participles? Participles are verbal adjectives. So they're verbs, but they can function in every way that an adjective can, which is to say it can be functioning kind of like a noun, or it could describe other nouns, or it could describe other verbs. Now, some people will be a stickler and say, that's not a participle, that's a gerund. When we say, or convert, or conjugate, walk into walking, I walk to the car, versus um, I went to the store by walking. It's it's a debatable point in, I'm just going with what I learned, participle instead of gerund. I hope that doesn't offend you. If it does offend you, you know what I'm talking about. Let's move on. So because participles are verbal adjectives, they have gender and number built in just like adjectives do. And just like adjectives, they can be functioning attributively. So it provides some sort of attribute about the head noun, the walking student. There's the predicate use or predicative. This is where the, the participle will be in the predicate position and either the verb to be will be present or there will be no verb. So we would say the student is walking. And lastly, there's the substantive use or substantival. And this is where the participle turns into a sort of noun, a substantive. Studying is fun. So for now, it's not this simple in the long run, but for now, just translate your participles with the ing we'll get into the the various uses later when it comes to parsing participles you're gonna have to add gender and number as well as the stem as well as the conjugation as well as the lexical as well as the inflected meaning so for example you might say masculine singular Cal participle from Katal, meaning killing. When it comes to feminine forms, there are two. There's only one masculine. This is in the singular. And it mirrors everything you've learned from adjectives. We're just applying it to these verbal roots in the Cal stem. Using Katal for our paradigm, we see the masculine singular Kotel. We see one version of the feminine singular, koteleth, and the other feminine, kotla. Masculine plural, kotlim. Feminine plural, kotloth. Now, the, the key to the participle, the cal participle, is that initial holum in the first syllable. That's really the diagnostic marker that separates it from the other conjugations. So you need to really be aware of that. And don't be surprised if instead of a holum, we have holum vav. That's right, we might see a holum vav in its place, but either way, it's an O-class first syllable vowel. And that's how you know you're dealing with cal participle. Many of the weak verbs follow the same strong pattern with that O-class first vowel. Here's a few examples. Nafal becomes Nofel. Ahmad becomes Omed. Yeshav becomes Yoshev. Savav becomes Sovev. Bachar becomes Bocher. Sha'al becomes Sho'el. Don't be surprised with some of the weeks, with some of the weak verbs, if you get some variations in the in the vowels, but 
it shouldn't throw you off because you still have your diagnostic O class vowel in the first syllable. Even the third chet, third ion weak verbs still follow the same strong pattern with one small exception and that's feminine singular with the tav ending variation. And it's even still going to use the holum or the holum vav, so it should not throw you off. For example, shalach becomes sholachath. Shama becomes shomaath. The same is true of third aleph, weak verbs. In the feminine singular with the tav ending variation, we have a slight change, but again, we still have our diagnostic O class vowel in the first syllable. Matza becomes motseth. Third hey requires some special attention. We see some lengthening because of the presence of that hey. We've seen this before. This is not a new concept. So be able to distinguish between masculine singular and feminine singular with third hey. For example, look at bana. Masculine singular becomes bonne with a segol. Feminine singular becomes bona with a comets. And the other feminine is bonia. As far as bana is concerned, you pretty much need to memorize it. When it comes to biconsonantals, these will look identical to the cal perfect third masculine singular, cal perfect third feminine singular. Context will be key. So masculine singular looks like com, third feminine singular, kama. Once you get into the plural, it's easy to recognize because there is no similar endings for actual verbs apart from the participles that look like nouns. So process of elimination, that's easy. It's the singular that you have to watch out for. So let's talk about usage. First, we talked about the attributive use where it directly modifies a head noun. In order for this to be true, it must match in gender, in number, and in definiteness. Does it have the definite article or not? It needs to match in all three categories. Now, a, a key aspect of translating attributive is sometimes you will need to add who, who is, who are, something along those lines. So instead of the sleeping giant, you might say the giant who is sleeping. Context will be key. Then again, there's the predicative use. This involves the word to be in English. So we might supply is. You know you're dealing with predicative when the participle matches in gender and number, but not definiteness. This participle can never, never take the definite article. Generally speaking, the participle will follow the head noun. So word order can be helpful, but it's not a guarantee. And as we've discussed, there's no tense. So you must derive any aspect of time from the context. Meaning, are you going to use is present tense or was past tense? Context will be key. And then there's the substantive. This is where it functions as a noun. There will be no other noun present. So this participle will be standing alone. When this happens, it could be the subject of the verb. It could be the object of the verb. Yes, it can take a definite article. Yes, it can appear in a construct chain. Yes, it can take pronominal suffixes. Yes, it can take prepositional prefixes. Now. The participle can also be passive. What is passive? Well, when it's active voice, the subject does the action of the verb. When it's passive voice, the subject receives the action of the verb. So David 
killed Goliath. This is active voice. David is doing the action. Goliath was killed by David. This is passive voice. Goliath is the subject, and Goliath received the action by someone else or something else. So that's the difference between active and passive. Cal has its own passive form for participles. So you can have an active, regular old participle, or you can have a passive participle in the Cal stem. In the passive, it's going to look very similar to an infinitive absolute, except instead of a holum vav, it will have a shirik in the stem vowel position. And it only has one feminine form in the singular. So masculine singular, katul. Feminine singular, ketula. In the plural, masculine plural, ketulim. In the feminine, ketuloth. So the key diagnostic marker in the cal participle is actually the shurik, stem vowel. So it's still an O class, or in this case, I guess you could say it's a U class, but it's not in the first syllable. It's in the stem vowel position. Is that a thing? I just made it a thing. Don't be surprised if the shurik changes to kibitz. So we can have defective spelling here, kibitz. When it comes to weak verbs, it follows the same pattern. There's really no variation. Except for third hay. That dang third hay. So third hay was apparently, originally, a third yod. And, you know, languages, they evolve. So the yod was eventually changed to a hay. But when we look at the participles, third hay verbs actually revert back to their old yod ways. So whenever you see a yod towards the end, you need to be thinking, this is third hey. So look at the example from bana, masculine singular, banu. There's a yod there, but I'm not really, I'm not pronouncing it at all. Feminine singular, binuya. Masculine plural, binuyim. Feminine plural, binuyoth. These cal Passive participles can be attributive, they could be predicative, they could be substantival, all the same, and all the same requirements for the attributive, predicative, and substantival. When it comes to the substantival cal passive participle, you might need to add one who in the translation, the one who is, so be mindful of that. Lastly, totally unrelated to the cal participle, Let's look at Adonai, Lord. Did you know that often Yahweh is not spoken or read as Yahweh? It's actually one of the options is Adonai, to pronounce it Adonai, Lord. Well, in Hebrew, Adonai has a couple different spelling variations. We don't exactly know why. There are some guesses. There's some theories. So there are other words like rabbi uh, that share this same kind of tendency, but uh, the normal spelling of Adonai ends in Comet's Yod, but the variation ends in Pathak Yod. And, and there are other words that do this, like Rabbi, like I mentioned, but we don't know all the details as to why. Just be aware of it. What's questionable is whether Adonai includes the pronominal suffix for my my lord. Again, we don't actually know, but if we compare with the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, uh, oftentimes, but not always, Adonai is translated simply as Kyrios, Lord, without any pronoun. So it would suggest, but again, not prove, Adonai is simply Lord, as opposed to my lord. Again, context will be key. That's it for this week. Next week, we're going to cover the basics of syntax. After that, we're going to start diving into the derived stems. We'll see you next week.